And we're recording. So um, in their absence, hello, Emily and Jeremy. We're sorry you cannot be here with us today, but uh, this recording is for you. Um, so today we're going to talk about the publishing cooperative workflow. Uh, this is, as we've mentioned, the transition into more technical training. So um, we're going to ease into it today. Kathy will be joining us uh, a little bit later, if she's not here already, to um, sort of bridge, bridge the gap, if you will, between Scribe and the cohort members in terms of kind of her, her way to explain um, the workflow and composition as well. So you'll hear it a few different ways, um, and hopefully one of those ways will resonate or stick with you. Before we get started, um, are there any sort of general questions? Nathan, you posted actually a question to the group, thank you, um, about whether or not that SAI tab can be moved anywhere else. And Elvis, what's, what's the scoop? So we've talked to our developer here um, and we're looking into it um, because here we've actually never moved it. It just lives where it lives. And I think on a Mac, it exists as a separate like little um, bar on its own. Um, so um, I'm actually going to test that after our class um, and see how, uh, how that works. Um, we suspect it might not work, but we don't want to say right away that you can't move it around. I think you can, but we're still... Um, up in the air. Let's call it that. Thanks. Um, even if that doesn't work, I, I'm not, I couldn't find a way to do this. So another mm -hmm. alternative might be if it could default over to the home tab. Okay. Um, or something like that where I don't have to keep on clicking every time I open up a document to get to my most used tools. Right. Right. Since the SAI floats out there. Okay. So we'll keep that in mind as an alternative if we can't get it to move somewhere else on your ribbon. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, then how about your impressions or your takeaways from unit six? What was it like reading through? Were you kind of holding on for dear life or had you heard some of these concepts enough that you're like, oh, it's starting to come together? For example, if we were to ask you uh, what the well-formed document workflow is, uh, would you be able to answer in a sentence? I'm okay now. I finally have gotten the hang of the well-formed document workflow and I, I, I can follow the chart. It's a little scary that the editing is like only like you're not even a third of the way through <laughs> in the whole process at that you know at the editing stage um it's it's this uh composition piece that's sort of freaking me out because there are so many different options i mean that that list of styles is 38 pages long you know it's i okay Great. Tell us what we, you know, how, yeah. how we deal with that. <laughs> well, thank you, Myra. It's really nice to have a jumping off point. So we appreciate your impressions. And yes, I, I think we're all sort of accustomed to thinking of editing as like almost finished. And so to see it in the first third of the workflow may be a bit of a surprise. Um, and so that is something we can talk more about. And then with the um, SCML list that you mentioned, the very, very long, extensive list, um, we did reduce that to a shorter list um, of just textbook, things that we see most often in textbooks so that you wouldn't have to kind of muddle through and, and um, navigate those 35 pages. And I know Elvis and Mike have mentioned there are things on that list that they have never used in their years of working at Scribe. So um, a lot of it is, you know, sort of uh, there in case you need it, but you're going to turn to um, a shorter, more familiar list of SCML styles as you work in textbooks. And so um, we, as I mentioned, shortened that list. If it's not in this unit, I can't remember call off the top of my head, it's certainly in the next unit. So you can refer to that rather than the, um, the, the very thorough scribe list, if that makes it a bit easier, which I think it certainly would for me. Well, there is an abbreviated S, you know, 
SCML list, but it all leads to the long list. <laughs> <laughs> and then you do have textbooks commonly include, and that's a sort of more manageable list too. So yeah, yeah, I think that's a good one to turn to. And I know what you mean. And that's actually been some other feedback we've received in the feedback form. Thank you and keep it coming is um, sort of that experience of clicking out of Canvas and into the scribe list, um, not everybody's favorite thing. So with the um, shorter list of textbook elements, I think using the one in Canvas uh, will suffice, especially early on as we're kind of getting our feet wet. Mm. So, um, Myra, since you mentioned you feel you have a handle on well-formed document workflow, could you uh, take a stab at just saying what, what it is in a sentence or so? I was afraid of that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, the world, it, it is the, the workflow of to get a manuscript into all its final forms. Um, and it just shows how it goes through the editing process, but then that uh, edited manuscript still needs to be formatted in so many ways and the typesetting and then, and then it needs to um, go into the many different formats that it would go to. So it has to be printable, it has to be available on the web, it has to be available in all the electronic formats, uh, the PDF, the, the whatnot. And so um, the workflow shows you how that happens. <laughs> yes, great, thank you. It shows you the many stages of the workflow and it's named the well-formed workflow because Scribe considers it you know, to be the best, most efficient method for their work considering all of the people involved in producing a manuscript. And to ensure that well-formed document workflow you compose. And so um, would anyone like to take a stab at defining composition? And when we say composing a file, what we mean just broadly, it doesn't have to be a technical explanation, just kind of what the heck does compose mean? I understand it to mean applying um, styles and structure indicators and elements or that will arrange the elements and styles as needed throughout a document or a manuscript. Thanks, Adam. That sounds great. Yeah, it's um, identifying styles throughout a document in a consistent way um, so that the, the manuscript is uncomposed. Um, yeah, I, had a I had a question. Um, um, since I work with, uh, with DSpace, um, for sharing out purposes um, for, of, of a version of this document that's editable, um, uh, would it be the XML version or the Word version before SAI or? I tend to think of it as the Word version just because I think that's what most people are comfortable using. Mm -hmm. And um, that seems to be a standard you know, across the open textbook library almost, uh, there are so many PDFs in the library when people are looking for the editable version of that uh, textbook, they're commonly asking for the Word file, uh, understandably so. Elvis, Mike, would you say anything different? I'd say that you're correct. The Word file is the, the best one for, um, to hand out to other people for review or to be able to edit just because uh, most people are familiar with Word. Um, if you hand somebody an XML file, they may not know exactly what they're looking at. So um, the Word file is the best uh, format to, to use for uh, that process. So that would be um, um, the Word file in the format prior to the application of any SAI templates? Now that depends on what stage um, what stage your, uh, your book is in or your project is in. Uh, because if it's in this stage where it's still right in the beginning and we haven't applied, you know, like a copy editor hasn't taken a look at it, whatnot, then, you know, the Word file as it is, is fine. But you can also share the Word file after it's been composed, after structure has been applied, as Adam said. Um, and so uh, that, is, that transfers over with the file. So you don't need to worry about, um, you know, the author's or anybody reviewing it sort of messing with that. Um, and if like, let's say you are way down the line and your book is already completed and you actually are 
submitting this for review because you're getting, you know, a revised edition. There's a way, and we'll talk about that later when we talk about the more technical stuff, but there's a way to actually get everything back into Word so that somebody can edit and then provide those changes. And it's, it's a pretty um, straightforward process. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Is the Word, is there a, a way of looking at it that is simple without a lot of tags? I mean, I know there's the... Mm -hmm. You know, you can turn on and off the paragraph tags and whatnot, but mm -hmm. but then it's, is it starting to, you know, they said it was pink, you know, titles are pink or whatever. Right. Is, is, so is that composed version of Word then strange along those ways? I mean, right. so what does we, it have all those markings, markups? Right. So what we do, um, those markups, like, for example, the, the pink and the green for italics and... and you know, blue for, you know, Hebrew or whatever it might be. Those are just uh, rendering choices we've made to make things easier for us to see. We can actually turn all that stuff off. Um, you actually just can go in and apply like black font to everything and you won't lose any of what you've done um, composition wise because that's, that exists as a something separate. And again, we'll talk more about that um, once we get the class underway, but um, you'll be able to pretty much, send this in a way to somebody who may not be familiar with our styles or anything like that in a way that they're just going to see, for example, something as italic rather than green and highlighted or whatever it might be. Okay. So yeah, there is a way to do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for those questions. I really appreciate the thought in terms of making adaptable, editable files available. Um, the other thing that I find helpful, so this is Marilyn, is that going through this class at the same time I'm doing my final proofing on an article, I get some of the sense of what's going on um, for, for me, for them, while I'm doing this other work. So I, I really appreciate this uh, kind of opportunity. So thank okay. you. Thanks, Marilyn. Um, okay, if there aren't any more questions, I think we will... Um, segue into sort of the the talky part of uh, this first hour. So um, just to give you a preview of what's ahead, Elvis is going to talk a bit more about the Scribe add-in tool, how it fits into the well-formed document workflow. We're going to have our SAI uh, installation parte. Um, and then Kathy, who is joining us, is going to um, just talk us through composition as she presented it at Open Ed last year, which um, I hadn't seen until we were all presenting together. And I just thought it was so um, clearly explained. And she selected a lovely metaphor. Um, and even for me, I felt new things clicking into place uh, after having sat through, you know, a lot of scribe training myself. So I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, between Elvis and, and Mike and Kathy and all of us talking here that um, we'll start uh, clicking into uh, composition. And then after the halfway point of the class, we're going to start with some hands-on um, work, which will be a first. And we're going to also try um, breaking into two smaller groups within Zoom. Um, so stay tuned for that uh, fun lab time. So um, Kathy, does that work okay with your schedule if we do the um, SAI installation and Elvis gives a quick preview and then you could kind of jump in after that? Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Cool. okay. Thanks. All right, Elvis. Okay. So um, I just want to start talking about the well-formed document workflow. Um, I think you guys got the right idea of what it is, uh, but I do want to say this, that what we're going to do in the training that we're giving now, this orientation, uh, however you choose to call it, um, is going to provide sort of like the foundation for learning that continues, especially as you work with projects. Um, I think it has been... Um, I can say from like the last co uh, cohort that when it's amorphous and you sort of don't have your hands in it, it can seem a bit overwhelming. But once you're actually working on a project or like well, what we're going to do now when we um, go off into our hands on time, uh, you'll actually see how this um, all of this is going to sort of click into place. So don't panic is what I want to say uh, right from the very beginning. It is a lot of information. Um, um, as, as we mentioned before that, 
long list of SCML styles. Um, you're not supposed to memorize that. That's there as a you know, reference as something uh, for you to use. All those styles are available because we work with a variety of different, um, different types of books and they are all unique in their own way. And so because of this, we have this very, very, very long list um, of different SML styles. And so we sort of try to account for everything, but there is flexibility. And within textbooks, you will only be dealing with um, certain styles. As, I, as Karen mentioned before, in our talks, we've talk about styles that we never run across, you know, to actually use, but they're there uh, for uh, that purpose. So again, I say it's a lot of information and we're going to try not to do the whole throw the kitchen sink at you uh, approach. So we're going to, in this class, we're going to start with like some conceptual stuff and go off of that without fully immersing ourselves into SCML or anything like that. So um, again, don't panic. Uh, so again, the well-formed document workflow um, is our, um, let's say, our, our methods, our, our, um, our ways of doing things, our, um, and the way that we teach things um, to clients and to other people because we have found, as Karen mentioned, that this is the best way to sort of get from this very initial amorphous point of um, you know, acqu uh, acquiring a book and, you know, and, and getting it going to the end product. And so uh, the reason it's called well-formed is because the uh, sort of, I guess, linchpin would be the, the phrase of the well-formed document workflow is the SCML document. And the SCML document is well-formed in the sense that, um, and what that means just as a quick little terminology asterisk, um, well-formed, all that means is that when you have um, something in a computer language like XML, HTML, or anything like that, you have a beginning tag and an ending tag that indicates when, um, you know, whatever style ends and when the next one begins and so on and so forth. Um, so yes, so SCML stands for Scribe Markup Language. And so we use this document as sort of our archivable file because from there we can either, as I mentioned before, go back into Word once a project is complete or we can um, you know, um, apply changes and go into typeset or go directly into ebook and things like that. So um, as you can see from our module, and I'll provide the link here, as you can see from, from that little module, um, the well-formed document workflow starts off in this sort of stage of, you know, you have your source file, you acquired it, everything is now, um, you know, in your hands and, you know, your author has told you, hey, this is as good as it's going to get. This is ready to go off, you know, and actually go on and become a book. And so from there, um, you go through this, our, our little chart that's available. Um, if you click on that link um, and you, will, um, you compose that file, you apply structure to it, as Adam mentioned um, in, um, um, in that little question time, right? You apply structure and we'll talk more about that. But again, I don't want to go too deep into the technical aspects of that um, just yet. Um, so once, let's, let's say you've composed, right? Which just means applying structure to that document, once you've composed your document, we go through um, our digital hub, which is um, our web-based tool that essentially takes care of a lot of composition issues uh, for you so that you don't have to really think about those things when you're composing. Again, I'm mentioning something that we're going to talk in detail about later. So if it's not all clicking yet, you'll see how it will click in the next uh, class, in the next classes. And so from there, we go into editing as, as, as was mentioned before, we treat editing in this initial stage, in this first third of the workflow. We deal with it here because when we, um, when we are dealing with like later on typeset files, PDFs, and design files, it is much more difficult to apply changes. It is much more difficult to deal um, with um, massive changes, like for example, reordering of chapters or things like that. And things like that can be, an can be handled now um, in this first like word stage where things are easily uh, moved around um, and actually the author um, and yourselves can review these changes before having to go through an entire process of producing an entire new PDF, reviewing that, submitting corrections, and then back and forth like that. And so from there, um, I'm not going to get too extensive into this nor too into the weeds. From there, uh, we enter um, into what is production, um, which is where 
uh, Mike's expertise uh, comes in, uh, we convert that edited composed Word file into SCML, and from there uh, we typeset um, into, um, um, into InDesign, which then from there we produce the PDFs. There's a review stage at that, at that point, and after that, once everything has been approved, everything has been checked, and we know for sure that this uh, book is at, at the very best that it can be, then we proceed to uh, work in um, ebooks, right? And we start producing those, right? So that's just a very, very quick overview of what the well formed document workflow entails. If you look in that uh, module at the very end, uh, you'll see that the that the chart sort of changes and it's like a circle. Um, what that means is that once we get your file into the well formed document workflow, we can produce all kinds of files at different stages uh, depending on your needs. Um, also, what that means is that a manuscript can enter the well-formed document workflow at any stage. Like, for example, if you've already edited your files, then you can, we can take those, apply uh, structure, compose it, and off it goes into the well-formed document workflow. Um, does anybody have any questions up until now, or anybody feeling a little lost? No? Okay. Good. So... Um, in order to aid with the well-formed document workflow, we have several tools. There are tools in InDesign, uh, or for InDesign, excuse me, um, and those we'll talk about once we get to that stage, but we don't need to worry about those right now. Um, we have the Digital Hub, which I mentioned, which is our web-based tool for actually converting files so that you don't have to go through and do that manually. Um, I've actually been here long enough that I do remember when we used to convert all that stuff manually and it was not fun. So um, this is a lot easier now. Um, I will tell you that much. So um, the Digital Hub, again, we'll talk more about it in detail once we get really into the technical stuff. Um, but uh, the big one that we sort of want to start getting our, our, our heads wrapped around is the SAI. The SAI, the Scribe Add-in, um, is just what it says. It's an add-in for Word that helps us compose um, uh, the document without having to go through Word's other um, ways of applying composition, uh, composition styles and so on and so forth. And so that's what we're actually going to be uh, installing in a few minutes and, um, and sort of dealing with um, as you guys get ready to uh, start experimenting with what the well-formed document workflow is in the uh, coming classes. So uh, the Scribe add-in also has some editorial tools um, and some other options for indexing and things like that that we won't get too into detail uh, in, but of course, as you're experimenting, if you have any questions, you can always contact us and we're more than happy uh, to help. As Nathan reached out to us and asked if we can move the SAI, um, we're now looking into that to see if we can move that. Um, so we're always more than willing uh, to uh, to discuss um, any questions that you might have. Um, so um, just received the message. Um, it might be better for Kathy to um, go into uh, her presentation so it sort of gels together with what we're doing now um, rather than waiting until after the SAI installation just because we might run into some hiccups and some things that uh, will um, might extend that time and we don't want to uh, abuse of Kathy's time. So um, I'm going to, I don't know if I pass it over to Karen first or just straight to Kathy. Yeah, sorry. That was, uh, that was my little <laughs> chat to Elvis. Um, Kathy, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but perhaps it would be better to go now rather than sit through the installation if you like. It's up to you. Oh, now we can't hear you. Sure. You're going to put the uh, PowerPoint up? Sure. You're, you're still a little soft if you're able to. Is that better? Mm, marginally. Better? I could put this down. Yeah. Better? Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. You're welcome. So I put a, I put a link to some Google Slides um, in, in the chat in case you guys want to follow along that way. Um, Kathy can also share her screen. We're not looking at all of the slides. It is um, just slides, I think it's 12. I think it starts at 12. Yeah, starting at slide 12 in this deck. 
Okay. Slide 12. <clears throat> Can I control this or do you? Yeah, um, if you want to use the green share box at the bottom of Zoom, there's a little green oh, box with an arrow. Mm -hmm. And then it'll ask you um, what screen. And if you go into my main screen, mm -hmm. is that right? Mm -hmm. And then in Google Slides, if you go to view, present, we'll see your big slide. <clears throat> View, present, and we're in business. Thank you. I don't see it. <laughs> well, it's loading. <laughs> okay, there we go. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, this, uh, as Elvis was mentioning, whoa, where'd it go? We went, I went, hey, cut that out. What did I do? I'm giving away the show. How come it's going, oh, I have to go to one. Ah, no, which one is it, 10? No. Built a nest. Sorry, I was muted, 12. 12, 12? okay, there we go. Yeah. And I've got this control bar in the middle here. I don't know if I can move this down. Yes, I can, okay. So um, my when I was uh, in the first cohort, Okay, I had I said, oh, that's a pretty picture. I had no idea what what this meant, and uh, but through um, a lot of classes and a lot of work, uh, I have brought it to um, an understanding for me, um, and it's rather brilliant. I think I imagine most publishing um, companies have something like this flow, but uh, this one. Um, really does, it's clean, it's clear, and uh, it, it captures a lot of the confusion, um, except for I would like to be able to annotate this slide, and I know I can't do that, so I'm gonna annotate it with my voice. So this, as Elvis said, this shows graphically the process developed at Scribe, uh, which begins at the point of receiving the source manuscript, okay? so. First of all, there's a lot of work that goes on before you jump into this. Um, you want to try jumping into this with kind of a, uh, of a document that you've studied and um, looked at, tried to imagine what is the structure. If it's a chapter from one of your author's books, try to figure out what are the elements that are in that. How, how can you turn this Word document into a learning object? Uh, so that that means looking at where are the um, is there a summary are there goals uh, are there interactive areas that you want to bring out so it'll pop out for the students um, uh, so so whatever you're starting with here and you know you're going to be practicing whether it's the entire manuscript or just one piece be familiar with it and you, you put it in, you're gonna use the SAI tool, and the very first thing in the SAI tool is uh, very um, confusing, but you'll see. Um, and as you go along, you'll see, here's the source, here's the compose, and there's a gear. Every once in a while, you'll see a gear. And on the bottom part, there's two. So whenever the gear appears, that means that you're calling in the SAI tool of some sort. Uh, the the only thing is that um, that I'd like to add is there should be little arrows that go around and around here because you don't just go step one, step two, you go to step two, then you go to the refine, you go, you can, a lot of times the tools are so cool that they find mistakes and you have to go back and you can fix them because they actually sometimes tell you what the what the problem is. Um, very powerful tools. So whenever you, wherever you are on this list, I think it's good to remember that it is an iterative process. Uh, you want to go back and forth. So um, the the pre this is called pre-production, and so you've got your heavyweight here out here where you've gotten familiar with your uh, with your manuscript and then you're in the pre-production and I feel like this is the the big um, the 
the big bird in the room. Uh, this, the better you, the, the more creative and better you plan this part, the easier the rest of the situations are going to be for you. So um, as you're as you're looking at this pre-production, uh, the other thing, and Elvis did mention is that this entire line is the word document. Uh, it goes right from here, you're through this whole procedure in order to get to a file at the end with all the images, all the whatever you want, whatever's composed, all set, and that can then be converted for the InDesign file. Okay, so this is just giving you your, your raw materials, uh, but your refined raw materials. So word goes to the end here. Um, uh, okay, and Elvis, is this correct that if you are not planning on having a print version of your book, at the end of this, you could actually move right down to the electronic version and move through. Is that correct, Elvis? That is correct, yes. Okay, so for most of us, of course, in higher ed, we will wanna have that PDF version. So that's why we will probably take all our way. But if you're making a brochure or something, once you get good with all this stuff, who knows, you can just skip it and just make it an online tool. It's a lot of, the things you learn in this class will be applicable in a lot of places in your life besides the books that you're creating. So uh, just remember that and, and, and reach out. So we've gotten to the point where we've got this manuscript that has the structure. Um, it, it has, uh, you know, the, the font sizes, the, um, uh, not the font sizes, but it has the, the the structure of the book. When you get into the InDesign area, and this is completely InDesign, at the end of this, what you get is the, the print and PDF file format. So if you're after that PDF, this is where that will be uh, done. And But this is, again, a very long um, trip where you'll want to go around and around. You'll come back and forth. Plus, if you're working on a large book, you can imagine it takes you a while to get through uh, through the entire uh, one. one. Um, okay. So in, in this in design, this is where you're going to be create, defining the spacing of items, um, this defining the structure of the book when it comes to which cha the chapter starts here, the chapter ends here, the next chapter is going to begin here by using things called master pages. And then you also define the color. You choose different fonts, uh, something, if you look through some other, some textbooks, you'll find that sometimes if it's an activity for a student to do, they might change the font to something sans serif when the book has been in a serif font just to make that pop out to the student so they know oh this is something i want to that i know i'll be interacting with so <clears throat> indesign also has a set of of scribe tools that you will add to it to to help you design this and um so the point of this line is you're making you are visualizing the pedagogical elements of your book, okay? All the text has been in there, all the images are in there, but you know yourself if you just take a Word document and make it into PDF, it's nothing special, okay? Here it's really quite different with InDesign and the, the way you can, it's like a piece of art, I think. You're, you're, you really are creating the atmosphere of the book, uh, the, the the rigor of the book. Uh, think of all kinds of words where it clarifies what the job of that book is because it's the students are expecting to see certain things as they are in textbooks. So after you and here with the again you'll be going round and round in circles there's one section where you have to get the green dot 
or you can't go forward, okay? So I remember being there, and you'll, you'll remember this when you get there. Um, you say, oh, rats, it's orange. That means it's not too bad. If it's red, oh, my God, that's bad. Okay, so, but in that tool, which is the hub, it will give you um, tools which will help you see what is the problem. So um, along the way, I want to really... Um, emphasize that the scribe tools are extremely helpful in helping you discover what you need to change on that. So uh, here at the end of this, you've got your PDF, you've got your INDD file, which then goes to the magic of XML at the end for creating those uh, the eBooks or whatever you're, you're trying to do some, um, you know, and all of this can be part of the the files formats that you put up on your rep repository. Um, okay, so, and this is also, you see this little word? This is the word file that can, can be used. This is your source file that, that um, members will be downloading uh, to create their own. Um, uh, versions of this book. Uh, now Elvis again or Mike, it's not the version of Word you get at the end here, it's the version of Word we get at the end here. Is that correct? That's correct, right. You want to okay. use the one after you've gone through and you know edited, typeset, done all that yep. good stuff. Done all that. Uh, yep. Yeah, so you want to yep. use that as a final file for people to, uh, to edit and use as they need to. Okay. All right, great. So um, this is Word, this is InDesign, this is the, the hub and the scribe tools you'll be uh, using right there. And um, I don't remember what else. So this was, we had a, uh, our, our presentation was on piloting uh, open textbook uh, cooperative. So um, instead of, you notice that my, my, uh, order ordering i put the big one on the bottom the pre-production this is my pre-production and the production and electronic bam you're off you are you are going um and you're all ready and the book is more gar gorgeous and this slide is just about a book about writing and don't worry about shitty first drafts don't worry about it you can fix it and from um this is uh, just some pictures of my file uh, from the, uh, the physical chemistry book that I did. And of course, these are the word headings. Um, the, my author actually did a great job. He put it in the, uh, if you look in Word, you can see all of these headings. And um, then when you change them over, so can I go back? Oh, no, I did it. I did it. Sorry. Excuse me. So heading one, normal is what the paragraph is. Heading heading one again, and uh, <laughs> I'm not good at this, Karen. So in what we've done is we've taken oh this one. So instead of title, um, we now call it chapter name chapter number, excuse me, then chapter title, CT is chapter title, then um, this becomes the, this is the part, this is special, the summary and the goals is special, so we called it an EXH, an uh, EX heading, and this is the paragraph that goes after the example, is it example, uh, Elvis? It's exercise. Exercise, exercise heading, exercise example, okay? So um, then we move on to, so you can see those. Um, I have no idea what I'm doing. This didn't work at, at open ed, so I <laughs> got a chance. I think, to do I think it. it's great, it's great. Okay, so here's, uh, here, here, oh, I was showing here that this is the SAI template. Uh, I've got it selected, so you'll see there are all the gallery styles, all the things you need to find. There's cleanup over here, which is something that you want to use all the time. Every time you open it, every time you close it, you want to make sure you clean up and uh, find and replace. So Elvis is, and Mike will go over all of these things. And that will 
lead us. This is how uh, the final setup at that time. It is not going to look like this. It's, it's already quite different from this. But I set in, we set the styles so that this had a box around it with a different color in it and the colors of the chapter title. You know, these are, there's so much power and it, it once you change a chapter title, a chapter number to a color and a font, it will cascade through all the other chapter numbers. So you know, it doesn't matter how long your book is. It's really, really powerful. And uh, that was it. Okay. So um, I, I think that's all I have to say. Kathy, thank you so much. Um, it's really uh, great to get your perspective and um, hear you know, how you think about it and what you think about when you look at that well-formed document workflow chart, which is probably different than what Elvis thinks about it. So I think um, it is really great to, to hear your voice from the first cohort in terms of how you've made sense of it. I'll also highlight, you know, there at the end, Kathy was talking about playing with styles and the design and the choices that they're making in terms of how the book um, will read and appear. And so they're doing that in-house. They've been playing with that in-house, whereas when we heard from Karen Bjork, you know, as uh, Elvis, correct me if I'm wrong, they did not, you know, play with those styles. They kind of handed it over to Scribe and said, you know, we have a budget for this. We would like you to design it. So um, that's an example of some of the flexibility. Kathy's really all in with um, seeing what these tools can do. And others of you may follow suit or you may um, decide to do a middle path or um, have a budget to uh, ask Scribe to help you with it. So are there any questions for Kathy about um, what she talked through? I don't have any questions, but I really appreciated the way you framed the process, Kathy. So that was very good. Thank you. Thank you, Sunny. <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, very complex and I, uh, it's screw, I, I'm, I love complexity, so what can I say? Um, and I do want to say one thing. Karen's book was philosophy. I have a book that has formula after formula after formula with lots of alt texts and everything else. And so I think it's going to, it would cost us quite a bit more to put this book out than Karen. So we are trying to do a lot of it, uh, a lot of it in house, but I know we're going to get a lot of help from Scribe on this because there's no way we can uh, do such a complex book and have it be as fine as we want because this is our first book. We want to hit the world with it. You know, it's going to be a great book and we're going to need Scribe on that. So uh, yeah, it, it's nice to have options and you can always play with it even if they're playing with it, you know. <laughs> That's right. Okay. And that's All a good right. point too. Like uh, this is a very complex book that Kathy is jumping in with in terms of the formulas and length, and um, so it's nice to have a, a range of disciplines reflected in the in the co-ops. You can turn to people who've supported different types of um, books. Um, Myra has a question in the chat. Maybe we covered this, but do all the different versions have different ISBNs, or are they published with the same? Um, they, different versions do have different ISBNs, at least that's what Valker and ISBN say you should do. Um, so that's usually what I see. Okay, um, I think we're going to transition to uh, our installation party. Uh, it's a potluck, so I hope all of you guys brought a dish to share. Um, Shall we? I do want to say one thing before we move into that. Oh, Kathy uh, mentioned something um, that sort of brings in why we compose, why we do all this stuff in the beginning and why it might seem like it's so much work right at the beginning. It's once you have a good handle of everything in that pre-production um, portion of that graphic, um, you're going to see that everything else just sort of is easier, right? Um, you know, relatively speaking, because of course, if you have to learn, you know, InDesign and all that, there's some complexity there, but it's, it's infinitely better to work with something that is already composed. Like for example, Kathy wants to change the, 
you know, the chapter numbers to a serif font rather than a sans serif font, then you can do that in one fell swoop rather than having to go through each and every chapter number, right? And if you have a book that's, you know, 75 chapters, you can see where you can save some time with that. So the reason why we sort of, I don't want to say sell because that, that wouldn't be the, the word, but like sort of promote, I guess, um, the well-formed document workflow and this idea of getting things done early in the process rather than later is because we have found that it is much easier and you can actually focus on, on real issues with your book um, in these early stages rather than having to leave them off for the end and leaving them um, at a stage where you can't easily fix things. Um, so yeah, so uh, that's one of the reasons why we compose. So I'll, I'll send it back to Karen. Just wanted to mention that as, uh, as an idea as to why we do uh, the things that we do. Um, actually, Elvis, I think we're ready to start installing. So if you want to begin walking us through, unless I'm missing something. Um, no, I think we are, we are okay. Cool. So did everybody download the SAI from um, ScribeNet? If anybody hasn't, you can take the opportunity to do so uh, now. Let me see if I provide the link. And remember, you have to be signed in in order to actually see the full download. So why don't we start with um, just kind of a check-in, because I think I saw everyone nodding their heads. Maybe mm -hmm. you... Um, but I think Marilyn needs to install, so I might, I might just go briefly through that. Sure. Okay. Uh, so the link is available now in the chat. I'm actually gonna go ahead and share my, my screen here. Okay. So when you get to downloads, you should see um, the SAI and um, the word template. These are the two that, that we need at this point. So just go ahead and download those. I'm going to be running through this uh, with everyone. Um, the only thing is, is that I already have the SAI installed. Um, so um, it might come up with some little strangeness, but um, it should be the same process. And as we go through the download and install, please, um, you know, just shout mm -hmm. <laughs> if things are not working uh, as Elvis describes them, or if you see something different on your screen, uh, we'll count on you guys to just let us know when we need to stop or slow down. But otherwise, um, he's just going to keep walking us through this installation. Correct. So once you've downloaded um, the SAI and the word templates, um, what you'll want to do is you'll want to unzip each of them. Um, I think in Windows, uh, depending on your settings, you can actually enter into a zip folder as if it were a regular folder and it will pretend to install. It will not actually install if you do that. So make sure to unzip it. Um, so you want to unzip both the SAI setup.zip and the SCML Word templates. And so just going to look for a head nod to make sure that everybody is with me on the same page if you are following along yes okay so this SML word template we suggest that you put this in a um, in a like the root uh, drive of your sorry the root directory of your hard drive um, in Windows just because you'll be referring to it a lot you don't want to just leave it in downloads uh, because if you do then you might like empty out your downloads folder or empty out wherever it is that you downloaded it and then it'll cause some issues. So we suggest uh, putting that um, in the root drive of, sorry, the root directory of your drive. So just in your C drive or D drive, depending on what you use, um, and just place that there. The SAI setup can stay where it's at. Okay, so then when you go into the SAI setup unzipped folder, um, you'll want to just double click on this SAI setup.doc. That'll open up Word. Word is actually opening up on my second screen, but I'll move it over. And we'll get 
um, this little setup. Uh, depending on your settings in Word, you'll see um, this little uh, yellow bar. You'll want to hit Enable Content. And what that'll do, it'll bring up um, the terms pretty much of the SAI and the use of the SAI. Right? You can feel free to read through those, uh, but you want to click I agree, then put in your first, your last name, your company, and your email. And when you click OK, it'll give you this um, little dialog box saying that the installation was successful. For those of you who are following along, are we, are we still OK? I'll take the silences and affirmative. So once you do that, you'll click OK. It should open up your browser. Uh, and all this tells you is that your registration has been sent. Um, your information um, is just sent to Scribe saying, hey, you installed the SAI. We don't keep any of that information. It's just for us to know how many installs of the SAI are out there. So you want to exit out of that and open up Word again. And then once you open up Word, you should have the SAI as part of your ribbon up here. Once we get to that point, we'll want to go to User Settings. And once we click on User Settings, we'll, you'll, if this is the first time you're installing the SAI, um, it'll ask you to do this part automatically. Um, but if you've already installed it and you just hit cancel or anything like that, you can access this again by going to um, user settings. So here for the SCML template, you'll just click browse. And then you'll navigate to where you saved um, the um, SCML Word templates um, or SCR Word templates folder. So we saved it in D. So we'll go here. SCML Word templates. And it'll appear here. You just want to click on that and hit OK. And then you'll do the same for the SCML list. Again, navigate to that. It should save it, but if it's not pointing to the right folder, just navigate to it. And then click on SCML list, and then OK, and OK. And with that, the SCML, sorry, the SAI is um, installed. Okay, so I have some people who installed it today, so they just got a quick refresher. Uh, do we have any questions at this point? Or anybody running into issues where it's not, like what I showed is not what you're seeing? And of course, it goes without saying, I am on a PC, the installation for Mac. It's a little bit different, um, but um, I think that those who are on a Mac have already installed it. So we won't go through that here. Although if um, somebody in your team is on a Mac and they need to install it, um, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll get you situated with that. Okay. So with the SAI installed, and I think we haven't run into any issues or anything like that. Okay, Marilyn's not able to do that, but she will do it later. Um, Okay, and you can feel free to reach out to us um, if you do encounter any issues. So, and that goes for everybody. Um, if, um, again, if you have somebody on your team or you yourself can't do it right now um, and you need to install this, just please reach out to us. We're more than happy to help. Um, and it is, you know, we're here available to you. And you also have a ready-made opportunity at Tea Time, which is this coming Monday. Mm -hmm. If you um, run into anything, um, you can come there. Two. So I think we are right on schedule in terms of being about at the turn of the hour. And so um, now that we have the SAI installed, uh, we know that it's there and we'll um, start putting it to use in the next several weeks. For now, we're going to continue focusing on concepts and the idea of composition and using the short and sweet. Uh, list of textbook elements and so as Kathy explained um, and Elvis as well um, this this really I hope um, is starting to connect with unit one 
when we talked about textbook elements and different pedagogical tools that um, are put to use in textbooks to structure the reading experience for students. And so um, that is what we're gonna focus on today. Again, conceptually, just thinking about those textbook elements, which is what we call them in unit one. I'll put the link to those here to jog your memory. Um, this is a textbook element list that has been sort of cross-referenced with the uh, CML list. Um, Myra mentioned the very long list. This is the shorter list. These are common elements that you might find in a textbook. So uh, if you have not already, can you please go to probably in a separate tab, you might want to keep the uh, elements tab open for your reference as we uh, head into this lab portion. But this next Canvas link that I'm giving you, the composition link, you'll find there on that page, sample files. And it's possible that you uh, have already downloaded these, but just in case, you'll see three sample files at that Canvas link. And so what we're going to use next is the uncomposed file on that page. So that's the second of the three sample files. So OTN demo Redux one with a terrible pronunciation. You guys with me? Okay, Elvis. <laughs> I thought you were going to show. Over <laughs> <laughs> oh, you. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, just so it's a little easier. Okay. I'm going to actually pop this over here. So now that we've downloaded uh, the uh, OTN demo Redux, just to keep with the pronunciation, I am not <laughs> French. So. <Thank> <laughs> So what we'll do is we'll start trying to get a grasp of, of what it means to actually uh, compose. And so uh, we're going to stay in sort of this conceptual state uh, for now just because uh, we don't want to overload you with the SCML list or anything like that. Um, but com composition is actually something that um, I think comes naturally. Um, to us as, as you know, people just working uh, either in academia or, or in publishing. It's when we're looking at a document like the one that we're looking at here, uh, we can already sort of tell when certain things are delineated in certain ways or, you know, or what, you know, we can already start trying in our heads to label uh, things as what they are versus just what they look like, right? Because once we get to a document, like the one that we're looking at now, we see that there's certain indentation, there's uh, certain alignment, uh, there are, for example, uh, we'll have like, little instances of punctuation uh, that will indicate that something is not just a paragraph, it's something's not just um, text, right? And so to connect this to everything that we've uh, talked about, when you receive a manuscript and you're working um, on a project, uh, one of the first things that you should do is open up that file and just sort of scan through it quickly so that you can start picking up like, okay, look, this author I see, you know, indented whatever these might be. Even if you don't know what they are at the moment, at the moment, you will be able to at least say, well, this is something different. This is something to keep an eye out uh, for. Like, okay, they centered this. And that looks sort of like a, like I'll give this one away. That looks like a chapter number. So, you know, I'll know that chapter numbers are centered. So now I know to keep an eye out for that. And so you'll go through and look through this. I will give you a word of warning. Um, don't worry about the text that is in uh, this um, test document just because uh, that text is there as a placeholder. Um, if you're really interested to know where that came from, that is actually the Wikipedia page about cats. So um, you'll have that there. Um, and so once you scroll through the document, you're like, okay, I, I sort of see what they've done, but I see some things that are just like, they look like everything else. So I need to actually go in and, and start identifying these things. So normally what we would do is that we would get into the stage of applying styles uh, to 
uh, certain elements to make sure that we are labeling them as what they are versus what they look like, right? Structure versus rendering, and you'll hear me mention that um, throughout. But um, if, at this stage, what we're going to do is we're just going to call them as we call them. We're not going to use the terminology of SML. We're just going to use what you guys already know um, because you will see how that all relates to SML in the next um, class, right? So one of the first things that, that we do here at Scribe when we look at a file is we'll shift it into a different view. And so we'll go to view, we'll go to draft. That sort of brings everything up onto, um, onto sort of this, um, this screen layout that's just very easy to read. So can anybody tell me what they think this highlighted part is? And you can call it whatever it is, respond in the chat or, you know, um, audibly. Either way is fine. So what elements commonly found in a book might that be? Marilyn in the chat said title. Okay. Okay, anybody else want to take a guess? Or do we all agree with Marilyn? We're gonna take her as our, uh, as our leader. I would, I would call it a title also. Title. Yep. Okay, so good. So that is a title. That is the book title, right? And again, we'll talk more about like how you would compose that in SCML. But for now, what we should do just so that we have this idea and we can mark it up in our heads um, is actually just go in and t put in title, right? And the reason we put it in brackets, you can choose curly brackets. Um, that actually might be better since those are as common so that way you don't end up adding uh, text that then gets you know stuck in a in a document. So um, just uh -huh. just to uh, jump in again and echo Elvis, this is not, you're not learning the the composition process right now. This is purely conceptual. This is just a way for you to mark different elements of the book. So. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it could have been dash title. It could have mm -hmm. been all caps title. Like we're just right now for the sake of like looking at a document with these kind of glasses on, these composition glasses, we're just doing it in a way we thought would be easy for everybody in class rather than like using the SCML list and so on. So um, let us know if there's any questions about that. I just wanted to be really clear that this is not like the scribe way that we're now jumping into. This is just our our learning language here right right so we can think of this as the foundation because when you are when you are actually composing you'll be using the SAI for that and all that what you're learning now to just look at something and identify just based on either how it looks or how it fits into the rest of the book is key and essential to um, actually composing uh, properly what you want to do is just get this idea that you're looking at a document and you're looking beyond um, just the text. You're not reading it. You're not, um, and reading, when I say reading it, I mean you're not reading for sense or anything like that. You're just looking at it and saying, okay, this seems interesting. So by the way, uh, why would uh, we call that a title? Because that's a good thing. I, I want to know, like, what was the thought process to get just to the fact that this is a title? Like where, even if it seems mundane and like, oh, everybody should know this. I would like those who responded to sort of say like how they got that, that, that this first one was a title. It's just so. This is Marilyn. I, mm -hmm. I just put in the um, chat. It's mm -hmm. like our intuitive understanding of what this looks like, right? Mm -hmm. So it's at the top. <laughs> to mm -hmm. me, a title always is at the beginning. So mm -hmm. that's I just jumped there. Right, right. And see, that's good. That is exactly it. You're looking at it, and you're not delving into you know unknown territories of your unconscious mind to figure you know things. It's <laughs> <laughs> you're looking at things as right, um, what they are. No, I'm not really thinking about it. It's just coming like, you know, right. snap, right. there it is. That's right. what you're so, looking for us to do right now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. sorry. I'll, I'll mute myself. My phone's okay. So too, like, you know, Marilyn described it as intuitive understanding. This is also sort of an exercise in which you can trust yourself. Like you mm -hmm. already know these things. The SML list may seem like, what is this? Like, I don't know how to do this. This is overwhelming. But as you can see, like you actually already have a lot of this knowledge um, just from all your years of reading books. Yep, 
Exactly. And the way that, but, that you can... But, uh -huh, go ahead. So, so there are so many different levels of titles. I mean, this mm -hmm. seems to be like the title, you know, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. the title gets repeated, you know, it'll be, you know, there's, there's the, I, f I don't know, I forgot what all those terms are. There's mm -hmm. like a page with the title, then the page with the title again sometimes, and mm -hmm. then it's on top of, you know, the table of contents, and then it's, I mean, it's in many places, so. Mm -hmm. I was, I was thinking that I couldn't think of a larger category besides title. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I think this is the very top of the hierarchy mm -hmm. conceptually. Yeah. And I think you're both right. It's like you're looking at this and you're saying, okay, if I call this a title, if this comes up again, right, what am I going to call it, right? And then there are certain terms that we can call it, you know, for now, but right now we're not focused on specifically those terms or those publishing terms or even scribe terms. We're just wanting to identify and say, okay, this is something different. So for example, um, on the screen here, you'll see that, hey, that title repeats again. So are we going to call that title or are we going to call that something else, right? Um, so actually that would be the question, right? What would, um, what would you guys call this second title? And it could be something just off the top of your head. You don't have to use the exact terminology. Actually, it would, if I saw that, it would make me reassess me calling the first thing title. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe it should be an H1. Uh, okay. you know, maybe it should be a header. Okay. So the way that I would approach this is say, okay, this is a manuscript and I have more or less an idea of what it's going to be. You know, if it's a monograph, it's a textbook, whatnot. But most books have this sort of hierarchy, right? And the Chicago Manual of Style does a really good job of sort of uh, delineating the, the parts of the book, right? It's even though that, that's mostly for like humanities and, um, um, and literature and whatnot. So, but if we go off of that and we use that as sort of our base and say, okay, well, we called the first one title and I'm going to be confident right? Because as Karen said, I'm trusting myself. I'm going to call that one title. It doesn't matter if you call this one title two, right? You've now de delineated that as something different and something that's going to be treated different than the first title. And that's the other thing about composition that we have to think about, that when you're really separating these things, you're saying, okay, I know that all of these, for example, later on, all of these are headers, so I'm going to just call them all head one. But then underneath that head, there's a subhead that, you know, is styled a little bit different, it's formatted a little bit different, but it's consistent throughout. And you're like, okay, well, these are now head two. Now you've labeled one as head one and the other one as head two. So now there is no chance that you're going to end up conflating the two heads and then end up messing with the structure of whatever the author was thinking of. So as long as you're giving it let's call it this way, if as long as you're giving it a name that's unique to what that is versus what it looks like, then you're okay. And especially if you're doing that consistently. Uh, one of the things that we teach here, especially when we start composition, is to do it consistently. The reason why is because let's say I made a mistake and I, style, and I compose, quote unquote, um, all the, the second level heads as third level heads, whatever we're going to call those. Um, if I did that consistently, it's a simple fix to go in and change all my third level heads to second level heads. It makes, more, um, it makes it easier because we were consistent. Now, if you're inconsistent, that's where issues uh, come in. So for example, let's, we'll just for now call that um, title two, right? So let's do just another quick one just to get into some actual text, right? So this one we might have to read a little bit, but what would we call this highlighted part? Like a disclaimer. Okay. We can call it disclaimer. Right now we're in like the front matter, which is mm -hmm. like totally different than the whole rest of the book's going to be anyway. And right. it probably is going to have different formatting than the rest of the book. So I'm not quite sure how to deal with that. Okay. Well, so for example, um, Adam mentioned that this looks like a disclaimer. So we are in the front matter, right? Which is a good, um, 
you know, a good way to start thinking, say, okay, what part of the book am I in, right? Uh, versus like I'm in the main text or I'm in the rear matter or I'm in something, um, you know, like an appendix or something like that, right? Um, and so when we're looking at this, right, we're saying, okay, so we're in the front matter. And what usually goes in the front matter is, well, you know, it's the copyright text, right? And if you take a, a, just a quick look at it, this little disclaimer says, this is a work of fiction, so on and so on, right? And then it continues on and says copyright. And we know that from just reading books and just our experience with it, that the copyright uh, text and the copyright um, information is usually all on one page right after um, this second title. Uh, so, for example, we could call that disclaimer in the, um, in the thinking now, but later on when we want to be more specific and we actually want to use those terms, we could actually cop call this copyright text. And then we know that the rest of this, right, is all copyright text because all of this is information about the copyright of the book, right? And so then we could just go ahead and label the rest of it as copyright text. And just to get into the idea of like using like those publishing terms, right? Uh, this second title, right, is often referred to as a half title. Mm -hmm. Actually, excuse me, half title up here. And there we have our title. And the reason why is because that half title page is that page when you first open up a book um, and it just gives you the title, no subtitle, no author, no publisher, none of that. And then it just, as it continues, you'll see often um, information like this, which I won't tell you what that is because we're going to be dealing with that in the lab. Um, and then we'll get to, you know, the actual title page. And then this, um, I'll give this one away just um, so that we can see that the thinking behind it, this would then be a subtitle. And so Elvis is talking us through the front matter, which mm -hmm. in some ways is more complex than the chapters that you're mm -hmm. going to be working with in, in the lab. Um, so this is for the sake of sort of demonstration and conversation. Um, just wanted to reassure you that we'll be working also with real chapters. Right. Um, actually, I'll, I'll just scroll, scroll through here. There are actual real chapters in this. I just don't want to get too far into that because I want to leave some stuff for uh, when we're working in our separate groups. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Or have I lost anybody? Because that's perfectly valid as well. So would you put copyright text on every single line of that? Mm -hmm. I would, because they would all be treated the same. The same. But, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Often if you look at the, there is a little caveat, but I don't want to get into that one. But if you often look at, at any book, when you're, um, when you're looking at that copyright page, um, all the text is often the same it's the same font it's you know there's the same letting it's it's all the same and i think michael's showing us uh just a little bit there on uh on his screen so let me stop sharing now just so you can see that there we go let me make sure yeah so you'll see it's like this very very tiny font um and it has all the information, it has the Library of Congress information and all that. So you, you would want to um, compose, well, style, tag, label, um, all of this as copyright text. It's all treated the same. Thanks, Michael. So um, any other questions? Okay, it's your turn. Okay. This is the this is the point where um, we'll try breaking you into two groups. Elvis and Mike will be uh, distributed among those two groups, but they are not there to lead you in this activity. They are just there in a pinch if you get stuck or you have questions. Um, so when you break into your groups, someone will need to sort of lead the conversation. Um, I recommend that everyone you know open this this uh, uncomposed file so that you have it in front of you. And um, you're going to do exactly what Elvis just demonstrated in terms of what do we think this is? What would we call this? Again, the emphasis is more on just the concept and the thinking process rather than like, I need to know what this is called. Um, so that's gonna be the activity for the next uh, 20 minutes or so working through the, the uh, sample chapters here. 
Are there any questions before we break into those two groups about what you guys are going to be doing? Is that in the same document about cats? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry if you're a dog person. <laughs> you can take that two different ways. <laughs> <laughs> I had a I had a question about um, the uh, sort of the pain on the left, the very thin pain that says all normal, normal, normal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My my screen isn't showing that, and okay, and and, and uh, I've got it installed and everything, but it, mm -hmm. I don't have that uh, little pain. Okay, I'll run through that uh, briefly. We won't need that right now, but. Um, what that's called, that's called the style area. Um, and so what that does is that it just shows you the paragraph style for the, um, for the paragraphs that you're looking at. As you can see, everything is normal. That means that uh, whoever wrote this, um, they didn't bother actually using word styles. Um, the way that you get that um, is if you go to File, Options, and I believe it's in Advanced. And yeah, if you scroll down, there's this style area pane width in draft and outline views. Um, likely for you, that is currently zero. Just change that to one or 0 0.5, however you prefer. Uh, and once you do that and hit OK, I'll go ahead and change it with you. Hit OK. That should bring that up. Um, and so uh, does anybody have questions about that? Thank you. Okay, not a problem. Okay, so um, not to repeat myself too much, but again, like if we were all in person together, we could do this in a handout, like in pen. So, you know, what you're typing into the document, it doesn't matter. Um, the exact name doesn't matter. It's just that exercise of thinking about parts of a textbook. So I think we're ready. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm going to try our two Zoom rooms. Again, um, Elvis and Mike will be distributed. I'll pop between the two, see how things are going. And then once you guys have talked through um, the document together and have kind of gotten into the groove, we will come back together as a larger group and just talk about that experience and how it will set you up for success for your uh, homework between now and next week. So I don't know what happens to the recording when we go into breakout rooms, but we'll find out. Okay. <laughs> Let's try this. Here you guys go. <laughs> Hi, Myra. Oh, wait, sorry, I think I muted you. Oh, there you go. Now we're just recording me. That's not good. 